Good morning. There we go. Uh, My name is Tim Hartwig. Currently, I serve at Bethany Seminary in Mankato, Minnesota, the ELS Seminary, and it's my pleasure to serve and lead you in worship this morning. With that, um, I am not familiar with the Wells chant tones, so I will not be singing the chant tones, but you are asked to sing in response. I figured it's better for me to read well than sing poorly, and so I'll read the, the lines, and if you can sing in response. May the Lord bless our worship. We begin with the first hymn. Please stand for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature. I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. Jesus, my Savior, pay for my sins. 
Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of what is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The first lesson for this Sunday is written for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 32, beginning at verse 15. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joseph heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, There is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, It is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. 
And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control, and so became a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers and he has blessed you this day. The word of the Lord. The second lesson and sermon text for today is written for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please stand. Holy Gospel for this Sunday is written for us in St. Matthew chapter 10, beginning at the 34th verse. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. 
Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is the epistle lesson, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. And we read these words again in the name of our Lord. But you, men of God, flee from all this. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. 
Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. Sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Jesus the Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Quite often I have people come to me expressing problems and wanting me to to solve them. Just two weeks ago I had a man come pretty determinedly into my office concerned about the landscaping and um, the grounds of Bethany College, which our seminary is on. And I patiently listened to the man, and all the while I'm thinking, this isn't my problem. As the president of the seminary, the grounds and the landscaping, that's not my problem. That's someone else's responsibility. This man, however, wanted me to fight to resolve this problem. But it wasn't my fight. It was someone else's problem, someone else's fight. Maybe you have people come to you with problems, or maybe you have fights in your life that aren't really your problem, and you just like to say, no, I'm not going to take up that fight. Well, there's a, a problem and a fight before us this morning that's not only my problem, my fight, it's also yours. The first sentence of our text says, but you, man of God, Now, we know that Paul wrote this to Timothy. But it's interesting that later on, Paul addresses Timothy specifically by name. But here he says, you man of God. And he uses the very general term for man, like mankind. In a sense, Paul was saying, you person of God. Not just you, Timothy, but all of you who are going to hear this letter to Timothy, you, you're the ones that God is speaking to here. So if you believe that Jesus is your Savior, if you claim to be a disciple of Christ, then God had Paul write this message for you. And God has a fight that is your fight. The good fight of faith. And so God, through Paul, urges us to fight the good fight of faith. To flee sin. And to take hold of the eternal life. So let's think about that first part. To to flee from sin. Paul in our text says flee from all things. And if you were to read the verses before, you can see all the different types of sin that Paul was talking about. But flee from sin. Now, If you're running from something, you're also running to something. 
if you're running from danger, to where are you running? You're running to hopefully safety, right? If you're, if you're running from evil, then to where are you running? Hopefully to good, right? And so it's no surprise that Paul says, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So God doesn't just tell us what to avoid, what to run from. He also tells us what to chase after to pursue those six things, six general things. So if we in our Christian life are going to flee from sin and pursue righteousness, that's a deliberate action to run from something and to run to something. Now, what do we see in our own lives? Well, at least for me, I often find that I actually like the things that I'm supposed to run from. And so I'll foolishly dabble with those things. And I, I mean foolishly. So what would you think of an alcoholic who just goes and hangs out at the bar? You, you'd think that that's crazy. Why are you putting yourself in danger like that? Run, flee from there. Get where you're safe. Or what would you, you think of a man having an affair who wants to break it up, but he, he goes out and hangs out with his mistress? You'd see that that's, that's foolish. You're, you're putting yourself in danger. Run. Run from those things. Run from that sin and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So God wants us to leave behind those things and to pursue his will for our lives. Now, it's, it's interesting that the word repent even though it's not mentioned here, the image of it is. Because one of the meanings of the word repent is to turn around. Okay. So if I was chasing after a sin, any sin, all sin, whatever it may be, when I repent, I turn around and I say, I'm not going after that anymore. I've had a change of heart and mind. I used to think those things were good, but now I realize they're bad. And they're not just evil, they're bad for me. They're bad for me in this life, and they are definitely bad for me in the life to come. Those things, though they may give me some pleasure in the moment, end up leading me to the fires of eternal hell. So the point of that is, this, this fleeing from these things and pursuing these things is a matter of life and death. If you're in a burning house, how hard would anyone have to convince you to run from the house? It's obvious, right? You stay in the house, you die. You'd flee from it and get to safety. Your sin is a burning house. And God calls you to flee from it, to run from it, and run to righteousness. Now, those, those six words are a very general term. Some 
lump them together. So righteousness and godliness, faith and love, and then endurance and, and uh, gentleness. And there certainly is some connection there. But let's just take some time to think about the first two, righteousness and godliness. So righteousness, its, it's, it's meaning is sort of contained right there in it, to do what is right. And then, and then godliness, again, the meaning is right there, to be like God. So when we think back to our first parents, what was the temptation that Satan came with? It was, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. But in reality, he got them to do not what was right, but what was wrong. Satan got them to go against God's expressed will. Don't eat that fruit. In attempt to become like God. So when we're fleeing from sin and, and pursuing righteousness we may wonder, well, what does that look like? What does it mean to be righteous? What does it mean to be like God? Well, who are you going to ask that question? Who are you going to get the answer from? If you go to Satan, what's he going to say? He's going to give you a very different answer than what God gives you. And so asking the right source for the answer is very important. So when you flee from sin and pursue righteousness, the person to ask is God. Because he will lay out his will for your life. And we could look at the Ten Commandments. And we can see how they guide just about every aspect of our earthly lives. If, if you want to know how God wants you to live, God is the one to ask. And he's not always going to tell you what you want to hear. And that can be tough. Because often we want to go along with God so just so far as he agrees with us or that we think it's a good choice. But we're to submit to the will of God for every aspect of our life, to pursue righteousness. And then we can take up, the, take hold of the eternal life to which God has called us. So, here's where we need to be very careful. We could read this first part of what Paul is saying and think, ah, if I pursue righteousness well enough, then I will obtain eternal life. If I, if I turn from my sins, if I make up for where I've done wrong, then God will grant me eternal life. Well, that's not going to work. Because just dipping my toe once into the water of sin demands that I die. And it doesn't matter what I do. I can never, ever atone for that sin because the wages of sin is always death. So when God, through Paul, tells us to take hold of eternal life, he cannot mean live a good enough life so that you get to heaven. There's got to be something else. And there is 
It's what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. God knew that you could never, ever keep his law perfectly. Because of our first parents, we're all corrupted from the moment of conception. We needed someone to come and live for us. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus managed to avoid sin every second, every moment of his life from the point of conception, he breathed his last. He never, ever gave in to temptation. And he did that for you. He wasn't just showing you how to do it. Hey, live like me and you'll get to heaven. No, he was living in your place. So when the Bible tells us that, that Jesus went home and was obedient to Mary and Joseph, his mother and father. There it's showing us how he kept the fourth commandment in our place because we were not obedient to our parents. We did not love and honor them the way that God requires. But Jesus did. Jesus carried that that heavy demand of righteousness, which is too heavy for us. And he perfectly carried it throughout his life, fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness. And he carried that righteousness all the way to the cross. And on the cross, he poured out his holy blood in payment for all of your sins. for all of your sins. Sometimes for me, Satan, my conscience, they remind me of how much I've lived in this world of sin. They remind me of the times when I even knew I was doing wrong and did it anyway. And I can look back at that and wonder, how can God save someone like me? How can a holy, righteous God look at me and say, I love you? Why would a holy, righteous God want me to be with him for any time, let alone eternity, How is this possible? Well, when I'm looking back at my guilt like that, and I'm searching for assurance of eternal life, I'm looking in the wrong place. I'm looking at the wrong person. I need to look at Jesus. He's the one that lived the life that the Father desires. He's the one that has made full satisfaction for all of my sins. He's the one that through his life and death has earned for me and for you and for all people eternal life. He's the one that we're to be looking at. And so when Paul urges Timothy to take hold of eternal life, he was urging him to take hold of Jesus and to never let him go. So how do we do that? Where do we find Jesus, to hold on to him. Maybe it would even be better to say to be held by Jesus. Where do we find him? We find him in his word. When we're reading the scriptures, 
That's Jesus speaking to us. That's him guiding our earthly lives and assuring us of his love and mercy. Whenever we open the Bible, Jesus is there wrapping his arms around us and assuring us that our sins are forgiven. That he and the Father love us. Whenever we bring people to the baptismal font, there is Jesus washing away guilt in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, adopting that person as a child of God. God is declaring before the world and in heaven, this one is mine. And when we come to this altar, for those who are properly instructed and prepared, we receive Jesus' very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. The very body that suffered on the cross in payment for our guilt, the very blood that was poured out in payment is ours bringing all the treasures of Jesus' life and death to us here in time. Through that blessed sacrament, Jesus is personally declaring to all who receive it, your sins are forgiven. I love you. Eternal life is yours. So take hold. Be in the word. Receive the sacrament when you are well prepared and well trained. And then you will be fully equipped to fight the good fight of faith. So this is our problem. It's our fight. It's, it's your fight. You can't set this aside. To be a Christian means that you're at war. At war with sin, death, and the devil. May God grant you his spirit through his word and sacraments that he would empower you to take up this fight, to flee from sin and to pursue righteousness and to take hold of the eternal life that Jesus has won for us all. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as we uh, confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed.
Be seated. And we pray the prayer of the church responsively. Triune God, you are the eternal God whose name we praise forever. We would not have known you if you did not reveal yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, yet one God. Remove from us all doubt and grant us humble faith as we contemplate this high and holy mystery. God, our Father, whatever is good is in us. Excuse me, whatever good is in us, whatever good things we have and whatever good we do comes from you alone. In you we live and move and have our being. Open our eyes to see the gifts you provide every day purely out of your own love and care. Lord Jesus, our Savior, you came into our world to make the Father known to us. You joined yourself to us by taking on our humanity and brought us back to God by shedding your blood. In love you walked the way of suffering and carried the wrath of God that we deserved because of our sins. Help us believe that all you did and all you endured, you did to rescue us and set us free in the bright hope of the resurrection. Create a spirit. You breathed into us new life by the power of the gospel. Opened our eyes to see the light of your grace and filled our minds with the clear sound of your voice. Through word and sacrament, lead us to understand more completely how broad and deep and high is the love of God in Christ Jesus. Firm up our resolve to do battle with Satan and sin. In every weakness be our strength, that we may show ourselves to be God's children, faithful in prayer, constant in hope, and fervent in love. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Holy Trinity, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, and the God of all comfort. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and praise your holy name forever. Amen. Almighty God, ruler of all, we praise you for your grace that has freed us from sin, death, and hell. As Independence Day nears, we also express our sincere thanks to you for the additional blessing of freedom that we enjoy as citizens of this nation. Let us never abuse the freedoms you have given us by engaging in loveless speech or lawless behavior. Instead, help us make the most of the freedoms we enjoy by strengthening us to serve God and country, family and neighbor. Amen.
we continue with the service of Holy Communion. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hand on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please be seated.
please stand. We give thanks to you, Lord, for he, excuse me. We give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning once again. I have a couple of announcements that have been asked to read, and um, they are that the office will be closed July 3rd and 4th, and then that Pastor Dan will be on vacation until July 5th. If you need pastoral assistance, please contact Pastor Ben or Pastor Matt at North Cross. And then the last one is please greet those around you. Um, so, uh, thank you for the privilege of leading you in worship today. As I said at the beginning, my name is Tim Hartwig. I serve at Bethany Seminary in Mankato, Minnesota. And um, with me, I have my little preaching bunny here, Isaac. He's one of my, my kids, and he tends to be the only one that wants to travel around with me. So, he's uh, my preaching buddy. That's all I have. The Lord's richest blessings to each and every one of you.